Welcome to the Kung Fu Discussion Group, Episode 5. Uh, this time we're going to be going over Qi development and Nei Gong. Fun stuff. As always, I'm your Uncle Sickness. You know where to find me. Links will be down in the description. I have my uh, trusty crew with me, Matt, Yoga Midnight, and Alex, Mako J. Cal. So, gentlemen, Qi, Qi development... And she development for Marshall Nagong. Um, I guess we should uh, start with some of the basics. So, uh, if you, and this is for the viewers as much as for you guys, more for the viewers than you guys. My teacher, Dr. Yang Zhuang Ming, the root of Chinese Qigong, he mentions in that book. There are basically two types of chi development. There's uh, nourishing the chi and training the chi or refining the chi, yang chi and liang chi. Um, nourishing the chi is building up the quantity of chi in your body. Uh, refining the chi is increasing the quality of the chi in your body. Um, so whether you're uh, whether you practice martial arts or not, you, you need, you know, qigong for health, qigong for martial arts, qi-based meditation. All of those are going are gonna to have elements of those two aspects in them. You've got to have qi in order to circulate it, and the qi has to be able to circulate in order to use it for whatever technique you're using. So... Um, those are, those are two really important things. Um, and they're not always explicitly discussed by a lot of teachers, you know? Uh, so one of the reasons I always recommend that book is that it specifically goes into that topic uh, over the course of it. You know, it talks about that, which is more than you get most of the time. So nourishing and refining, chi. Um, Easiest way to do both, obviously, is with breathing. So uh, the basic exercise, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and the way I usually teach it, and the way I've definitely written about it in the last few years, the basic exercise for meditation, for qigong, or for martial negong is breathing. Um, and here's a shameless little self-plug. You can pick up my book, A Brief Introduction to Meditation, where I lay out those those ideas. So, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the breathing, uh, breathing is an easy way for most people to feel chi for the first time. You know, actual breathing using your lungs. Even if it's, you know, kind of like a chest based breathing, it's better than just that shallow, you know, where they're only sucking air into their nasal cavities and and that's as, as much as their breathing goes, you know? Um, of course, abdominal breathing is the best. So, but, you know, being martial arts uh, guys, you guys already know the benefits of, of abdominal breathing. But from there, um, the next step is to increase your experience of chi. And that, of course, is the famous holding the ball chi sensitivity exercise that, um, yes, <laughs> yes. I love that one. Uh, I've been doing that pretty much since I was a little kid before I ever knew what martial arts or kung fu or China was. Um, so. Quick, can I ask a question? Yes. So, um, <clears throat> so I, this is a weird side note, but something I've experienced in the last uh, several years is that when I smoke weed, it like it can it like helps me be more conscious of like more aware of chi. Yeah. Like a cat sitting on me when I'm like high, it's like oh, it's like it's like pushing me down. <laughs> you know, it's there's, so like the other like last night I'd smoked a little, and I was playing with that with that sticking like we talked about last time, mm -hmm. like while petting my cat. Like I just for some reason, like I guess because cats are like yin animals, I think it's like easier to sort of like perceive the, the yeah. chi through. Cats have so, strong chi. So like a sticking exercise could be another um, version of like 
close to the ball. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's one way uh, to apply the ideas there um, because basically the reason breathing works to give you uh, an awareness of the chi sensations uh, is most like any kind of deliberate breathing where the only thing you're doing is breathing. It's going to increase your physical relaxation at a minimum. For most people, it will unconsciously, inadvertently, physically and mentally re relax them a little bit more than their normal levels. So deeper, like meditation helps with this because you're deliberately trying to go as deep as you can into physical and mental relaxation. The more relaxed you are, the more you're going to feel your own body. You're going to feel your own mass. You're going to feel your own weight, you know, your balance, stuff like that. Um, so the chi is just one, one uh, physiological sensation that you're going to increase the awareness of through deliberate, regular, sustained breathing practice. When you do the chi ball exercise, you have to be relaxed even more. But you can't go, you know, sloppy limp. Most people confuse, and Dr. Young is one of several teachers that makes this point repeatedly uh, in his work. There's a difference between loose and limp. There's a difference between relaxed and limp. You can be relaxed and still be standing up. So uh, if you understand the difference between loose and limp, you can profit from seated meditation or lying down meditation or walking meditation or standing meditation because you'll be able to meditate no matter what you're doing, you know? Uh, but if you're a sucker, you know, if you lie down and try to meditate, you're going to go completely limp and you're going to fucking fall asleep. And that's what losers do. Yes. <laughs> my students. I am, I am very harsh. I haven't had to beat either of you guys, but you've both seen the stick that I have that I use where if you do something I don't like, you get hit. If you ask me a stupid question, you get hit twice. If I think you're ugly, you get hit four times. <laughs> Uh, but you know, back to back to the matter at hand. Um, when when you can actually relax, but still stand up, still use your body, that's when you can start really getting into martial aspects um, based on chi and nagon and internal training. So. Uh, one of the reasons smoking weed will help a guy like you, Matt, is you don't get lost in being high, you know? Depends um, on what you smoke. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you, you see how it is with, you know, somebody, somebody drinks. Yeah. And their personality it's... completely changes, and they get carried away, and they're either rowdy or a dickhead or they become whatever. You know? however, however it is. They go off the edge. Yeah. Those are people that are getting carried away by alcohol. Mm. People get carried away by weed. They do all those pothead uh, stereotype things. They start giggling, squinty eyes, saying man all the time like Cheech and Chong. They get the munchies and they eat all the food. They fucking pass out. You know, that's, that's when you get carried away. If you just get high and get relaxed, you don't lose yourself. Mm. in the process of using that substance you get a huge boost in your mental and physical relaxation so yeah. it's one of those things where on a lot of martial arts groups in china in the past you know you get together with all of your classmates you know your seniors and your juniors and the people you train with and the teacher what are you doing you go into teacher's house you're gonna have a big dinner you're all gonna get fucking fucked up and then you're gonna spar and you're gonna talk about martial arts that's like that's the shit i mean i i like one of my personal failings as a side note as a teacher is when all three of us were living in the boston area i was too damn sick to do that but that's some really important shit like a way for somebody relatively new like mm -hmm. alex to profit from knowing people like me and matt that have been doing this for years already like you can catch up to a certain tubby individual in the course of about six months.
if you can hang out once a week with guys that have a decade or more experience, you know, because you get that body, which is, again, you get a little high, you start to relax mentally and physically. You see your cat or your dog, you put that hand on them. And when they go to move and try to get away from you, you keep it there and you follow them around. If you do, if you're like me, you probably did what I did uh, back, you know, before I got sick. Just dating a girl with two cats, was smoking weed all the time. So I got baked. I put my hand on one of her cat's heads and he tried to pull away. And I was like, I'm sticking to you. I'm sticking to you. And he got really upset because I was being incredibly obnoxious. And no matter what <laughs> he did, I'm sticking to you. You can't get away. <laughs> But that's, that's an easy way to train. That's a great way to train sticking and adhering because cats don't want things stuck to them, either in the literal sense that they don't want sticky shit on their fur, but they also don't want you touching them and just leaving your hands on them indefinitely. They don't want to be grabbed up. They don't want to be confined. So, uh, yeah, that's a good... You know, I'm not going to tell, you know, I'm not going to tell somebody, you know, quit their job and become a massive, uh, you know, pot smoker. And that's going to increase your Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. You know, you've both met a particular tubby individual who seemed to think that smoking an eighth of weed every single day for about 10 years was the same as practicing for at least an hour every single day for 10 years. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not the same. It can help, but it's not. It's not practice. Practice is practice. Weed is weed. Alcohol is alcohol. You know. Um, mm. Also, I, I, in, in my as my own practice has developed, I see I've recognized that increased re relaxation and the, the awareness that it gives as being, you know, one of the benefits in, of, or, or the necessity of daily practice. Because the way the world, whether like digitally or like with the fucking idiots that walk around outside, is to like pull you into this sort of chaotic state. Uh, which is like sleepwalking, you know, just like, you know, being anxious and not aware of your body. And, you know, so I think like a sort of something that I've found really helps me, over, especially over the last couple of years is like staying relaxed is like, is like number one priority, whatever I'm doing, like whether I'm riding the train or I'm working or practicing, you know, because uh, yeah. it opens the door for further you know, exploration. Exactly. And that's one of the basic ideas that differentiate internal martial arts or softer style martial arts from harder, external, less advanced martial arts is the simple biomechanical truth that before you can do anything with a part of your body, you have to relax. So you stand in your on guard stance don't tense all the muscles. That burns energy. That burns stamina. Even if you do that and you want to move at all, you have to relax and then move. So the way most people use their bodies, they're adding an extra step. And, you know, the, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. Um, most people are putting extra steps in there. And that's why, you know, even when I was sick, physically weak, physically hobbled, a lot slower than I was healthy uh, when I was healthy, a lot slower than I am now that I'm recovered, I was still able to move faster than people because, you know, the Xing Yi ideal. You move, my recognition of your movement and my reaction to it are simultaneous or near simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So even though I didn't have much behind... Uh, you know, my movements, my movements were well-timed. And because I know about anatomy, which is another aspect of martial arts that a lot of people don't study, you know, I don't have the, I didn't have the power while I was sick to just rail somebody in the face or the chest in kind of a dumb way and overpower them. I had to aim. I got to aim for that spot where if I hit you on the nose, even lightly, it's going to make your eyes tear up and close. If I hit you in that spot on the front of your neck, in the throat, It'll make you gasp and tighten up your chest and knock the wind out of yourself. I hit that spot 
just below the solar plexus. It's going to make you grab your gut and bend over in pain, you know. That kind of stuff was more important than ever before. Um, and that's a huge part of how a smaller person can beat a larger person, how an older person can beat a younger person. How, like I literally said, how a sick person could beat a healthy person. Because I would spar with Tubbs, the man called Tubbs, while I was sick. 140 pounds, a fucking 100 pounds lighter than him. And I'm still putting him on his ass like I was when I was my normal weight. How was that possible? You could say what he said. Oh, oh, Brad, you're so talented. Yeah, that's great. That's a great ego stroke. I appreciate mm. that. But the reality of it was, you know, if you poke somebody in this particular spot on my rib cage that I know you can't see, you're not going to be able to breathe for two minutes. I hit you in this spot on the back in this way with this motion that I know you can't see on camera. It's going to make you shit in your pants. If I press on the front of your abdomen in this particular spot with this motion that I know you can't see, it's going to make you piss yourself. And if I do it like this, it's going to make you piss blood. Did you get that from the centipede book? No, I got, I got all that stuff from studying anatomy, literally. Like I, awesome. When I was in junior high, my mom, um, my mom and dad had me take, uh, art classes so for the three years that i was in junior high i got a college level art de- uh, art education um not like you know the specialized shit that you get when you go to actual art college you know but like the stuff you learn as a freshman and sophomore at like mm-hmm. mass art or, or yeah. one of the, uh, like dedicated art schools basic drawing you know basic use of different materials different mediums and stuff like i got all that in junior high so for the drawing courses one of the things we did in addition to learning um you know how to use charcoal and pencil and pasta all that different shit i also learned like the basics of anatomy and i just kept up with it so by the time i started actually studying legit martial arts in college i already knew a certain amount about how the human body worked combined with my own uh athletic abilities from growing up in a sports family and playing team sports my whole life you know put me light years ahead of most other 18 19 year olds in a fight because i already knew i only need this much force at this point at this angle and it's going to make you fall on the ground you won't be hurt but you also won't be able to attack me so when i actually learned techniques to train it's like wow i don't even need to put that much force in anymore because you know you don't need much to uh to get the job done to bring that idea back to Xing Yi specifically in you phase 10 important theses uh about the practice of style uh the point is made a light application incapacitates an enemy a heavy application kills so you don't have to put all like you build up a lot of force it's like from practicing Xing Yi wrong you'll build up a lot of muscular power. But if you train Xin Yi correctly, you'll gain a lot of jin, a lot of refined force. Qi and strength combined, that's jin. Um, you don't need much to beat anybody. A regular person who doesn't know anything, a trained martial artist, it, like it doesn't matter. You know, When you can put out a moderate to a high amount of force, and you know where to put force into on a human body, you know, it's, it's that experience that you hear um, regular people describe uh, a seasoned, experienced martial arts practitioner. They touched me and I doubled over. That's what it was so training the chi uh, for martial purposes, training nagong is you're you're not only you're building up your sensitivity and awareness of your own body but you're also building up the ability to be sensitive and aware of other people's bodies so practicing sticking and adhering with a cat you have to be able to you know when you make physical contact and i am touching one of my girl's cats right now who's taking a nap just off camera i can feel his breathing I'm using my fingertips to touch him on his lower back, but I can feel the way he's breathing. 
when you're relaxed, when you're aware of how breathing affects a body, you start to get aware of how breathing affects any, any body. You know, once you know how it affects your body, everyone is the same. Everything is the same. So if you can feel the way your breathing changes your heart rate, your circulation, your, your pulse, you'll eventually get to a point where when you touch an opponent, you know, you're not just going to see, like you go on the information that you get visually, but there's also the tactile information. We cross hands. I can tell what your structure is like. I can tell if you're amped up or relaxed. I can tell because, you know, uh, both of you having security experience, there's a certain amount of like bullshit front you can put up with your posture, with your appearance. Anybody can do that. You can keep a cool, calm look on your face and be panicking inside. You can look amped up and look like you're about to go wild and be completely calm and collected inside. There's a lot of different combinations, internal and external. So breathing is the bridge between inside and outside, not just for you, but for everybody. But also it's your bridge between you and everybody else. You cross that bridge, you gain that skill. You know, you look at other people, you'll be able to see things. So it's, it's, an, it's a vital aspect of... Um, body language reading is also being able to read their, their, their heart rate through the, the rhythm and pattern of their breathing. And that's a really good indicator of somebody's mental state. So, you know, let's say, I don't know, as a random example, you work at maybe an art museum and it's full of completely insane screwhead drug addicts. And someone comes along and they say some shit and all the corny broads you work with are like, oh, so-and-so is so smart. Oh, oh, and you get to go, fuck that guy. He's a creep and a raper. He's on cocaine right now. How can you tell? Look at him. How can you not tell? Mm. Cocaine eye dilation. He's doing that lip thing. He keeps touching his nose. Look at how his heart's racing. You know, not that I'm talking about anybody particular. <clears throat> <clears throat> cowboy of love um, but yeah no the um, breathing is the easiest way in to a ton of great skills that you can learn for a ton of great reasons if it's health building if it's meditation if it's martial skill development if it's, if it's learning to, we were talking before we started to record about uh, improving your uh, comprehension and retention rate when you read. This is a great way to do that. You can turn reading into a type of meditation, but it's a type of meditation where you're not just practicing calm relaxation, you're also uploading information into your own subconscious, your own slightly unconscious aspect of yourself, you know? So bringing it back to martial arts stuff. Um, the, uh, I always like to start people for Qigong or meditation or martial arts. I start them with breathing for Qi awareness, holding the ball, you basically hold your hands up like you're holding a, a basketball or a volleyball or something, you know, like you're holding a ball between your hands and you try and relax and you just do that deep breathing and you don't, don't try to force it, you know, don't, because then you're just tensing and if you're an unlucky type or an unhealthy type, you might shit your pants. So you just work on feeling feeling your own chi radiating from your own body, you know, then there's, you know, it, it goes from there, you know, you start working on, working on it with a partner where you and another person are standing there with your eyes closed and maybe, you know, the easiest way uh, is you make the ball, they pass a hand vertically between your hands. 
you're trying to see if you can f- both feel their hand entering the, the ball that you've visualized, but you're also seeing if you can feel their chi approaching your area of effect. If you're doing the vertical passing, you're trying to feel when you enter their chi. You're trying to feel, you know, you're, it's two different ways of trying to feel how your chi and another person's chi interact. Okay. Then there's more martial aspects. You know, there's an exercise. Uh, I haven't really talked about this with either of you, but the same sort of thing, except instead of one person, you know, you're both standing there with your eyes closed, but instead of one person doing the ball and one person using both hands, you both take like a santi stance to do it a shingy way and you face each other and you put your intent on the other person, even though you can't see them. You just, you know that they're directly in front of you, just out of touch. So you both close your eyes and you reach out with your yi, your intent, and you put it on them. So what does that do? Well, if you're the receiver, if you're taking turns, one person is um, you know, emitting their yi, the other person is the receiver. If you're the receiver, you're seeing if you can feel somebody's intention on you. Furthermore, you're seeing if you can feel chi projected at you over space. If you're the sender, if you're the transmitter, you're trying to see if you can reach out with your chi and feel people in your proximity. You're seeing with your eyes closed if you want to be comic book about it. (coughs) Excuse me. I just realized I talked for like 20 minutes straight. But um, those are, those are some of the other, those are like more advanced types of exercises you can do. You know, Uh, one thing that I used to do with some of my uh, classmates, one of us would, would stand against a wall on one side of a room with our eyes closed and everybody else would be on the other side of the room. And randomly, quietly, people would approach the person with their eyes closed. And when you can feel somebody coming, you say, stop. So you see, you know, are you getting this close before I say stop? Or am I saying stop when you're still halfway across the room? Those are, those are types of things you can do to train that type of stuff. Um, Pushing hands in Tai Chi Chuan or Chi Sao in Wing Sun, uh, Wing Chun. Any kind of con- like soft contact partner exercise, you're working on feeling uh, like on a physical level, you're working on feeling how somebody is going to move or is moving through tactile contact. I touch your arm. You try to move it forward. I feel you coming. I can deflect you out to the side. We talked about that kind of stuff last episode. Um, but on a more energetic, like a chi level, a more advanced level, if you have the intent to move towards me, I want to be able to sense that. That's the purpose of pushing hands in Tai Chi Chuan. It isn't, oh, we're touching, so I knew you were coming. Yes, at a minimum, if you suck at martial arts, if you're kind of an insensitive person, you know, because you're touching them, you'll feel them trying to move toward you. You can do something to defend yourself. But on a more advanced level, you want to be able to feel the intention to advance. You want to be able to feel the intention to attack. So in Xing Yichuan and in Ba Guo Zhang, uh, you want to get to that level. You intend to attack me. I feel it and respond by punching you in the face or Bagua, I respond by stepping into your blind spot and chopping you in the back of the head. You know, that's, that's the, like a martial application of chi and meditation combined with martial arts. It, ooh, my internet connection is unstable. Um, 
so you get you get a big um, a big boost in your health just by combining breathing and and chi exercise with martial arts, but you also get a huge tactical and strategic advantage as well. So you don't just get better health and a better body; you get inside information. Like I say, when I'm talking shit to people uh, over martial arts, you know, how did I block your most powerfulest blow? Your body told me what you were going to do. I don't need to worry about being surprised. You're not going to surprise me. I can see you. So those are, those are some of the big benefits. Um, uh, the problem that a lot of people have is they don't know how to go about gaining those benefits, you know, building up those skills. Like I said at the beginning of this, breathing is your way in. Breathing is your way into your own body. Breathing is your way into other people. So, thoughts, questions, insights, anything. Dead air. Uh, being a novice in this, I the the only background that I have as far as this is concerned is I I have I do have a copy of um for our viewers I do have a copy of um the root of Chinese qigong but I have not gotten all the way through it unfortunately I the breathing breathing is the basis for kind of like how Santi sure is the basis for Xing Yi. Yeah. Breathing is, is uh, the same level. It's the basis for, for the meditation. I'm wondering if when, when you're, I guess, probably the best example is probably when you're practicing with another person, mm -hmm. does your breathing, I guess, I'm just going to go out and ask it, does your breathing get in sync? Do you kind yeah, of it can happen? Okay. Especially if you're practicing cooperatively, because you can practice. You can practice cooperatively. You can practice non-cooperatively. You can practice competitively. Competitive partner practice is basically a straight-up fight. Non-cooperative partner practice is. Um, trying to train for a real fight in a controlled environment. I'm not going to let you do your techniques on me, but I'm also not going to actually hurt you. You know, um, cooperative partner practice is the level that most people, I mean, obviously everybody starts there. Most people never leave there. I see. So in a Xing Yi context, if we do uh, five element pounding or Anshan pound, to get good at the routine, you have to practice cooperatively at first. But that's just to get good at performing the routine. To get the benefit from the routine, you have to get to a point where it's not cooperative. You know, so using ourselves as an example, I've got the most experience. I'm also the biggest. So if I'm training with Matt because of the size difference, if I don't use the full extension of my arms, I'm not going to get much benefit out of it. And Matt is really going to not get much benefit. I'm not going to get any benefit out of it because what's the point? Mm -hmm. If I train with Alex, we're closer in height, but I've got more experience. So I'm more comfortable. I can do it quicker. If I go at your speed if I don't actually go all the way, you know, if I don't make it like a real punch to your solar plexus when there's a punch to the center of the torso, how are you going to develop the reflexes to defend against a punch to your torso? You know, that's, that's why the uncooperative aspect is necessary. And then once you get to where I am, Alex, it has to be competitive. You know, like, Matt, once you learn Anshan Pao, it's going to be competitive if we practice together because, you know, 
Let's see what you got. How fast are you? How accurate are you? How fast can you go before you start to get sloppy in your attack and defense? You know, cool. how quickly can you move before you start to lose accuracy in those attacks? Before you start to have an off rhythm in those defenses? Mm. Um, a lot of people don't want to do that because they want to they want to stay in that place where they're comfortable. It it feels really nice when you reach the culmination of the cooperative stage of practice. I know the choreography now. I feel good about myself. Okay, well, to be honest, you can still get your ass kicked. When you see somebody who's a 10, 20 year martial artist get their ass kicked in a real fight, it's because they never left the cooperative stage of partner training. Mm. They may know applications, but they can't apply what they learned. If you see somebody that can actually fight, they went to at least the uncooperative level, probably to the competitive level. So. I found that to be the case, um, actually, in uh, my keto classes. Uh, interestingly enough, being, you know, much younger than I am, uh, a teenager and mildly stupid. Uh, <laughs> Um, All children are stupid. Don't feel bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm smarter now, but um, yeah, uh, the seeing seeing the adults train um, cooperatively, mm. not in a in an uncooperative sense. Um, even what what was supposed to be, I guess, the, at the time, what what I would describe now as being what's supposed to be uncooperative yeah. was very cooperative in, um, in Aikikai. Um, and whenever I, I, I watched the, uh, the adult class, I was always slightly disappointed. It was cool. It's like, oh, they're doing different, really cool stuff. Like, these are different techniques, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Dudes in these giant, you know, poofy samurai pants, you know, throwing dudes around in these white geese. It looks cool. But it's not, it's, it's some of these guys have been doing it for like 20 years or long, maybe even longer than you, Brad, but like, yeah. these guys will get their asses handed to them in a fight. And the dudes that have been doing it for 30 years could probably take somebody in a fight. Yeah. Yeah, there's a reason why Steven Seagal looked so cool in his movies. Yeah. I mean, granted, Steven Seagal is a whole other subject, and uh, <laughs> Very amazing <laughs> stories about him don't need to be touched on at this point, but mm. you know, in his movies at least, that's what Aikido is supposed to look like when you're applying it to people who are not cooperating with you. Yeah, if it's just you know, one hand, oh, yes, oh, oh, yes, oh. you know, maybe those old videos from like the 50s and 60s of Oh Sensei. You know, using one hand and sending people tumbling across the floor. All right, that's great. How old was he at the time? An old man who's been practicing martial arts competitively, shall we say, to keep turn consistency for that many decades, should be able to do that to a chump. Yeah. We're not going to do that. Regular, like, regular guys, a beginner's not going to do that. Even, you know... Most 40-year-olds with 20 years of practice aren't going to do that. It's going to look differently. You have to, you have to use what you've got. You yeah. Know? So um, one of the nice things about Xing Yi is the way the training is designed is the way you're going to use it with five years of experience is the same way you're going to use it with 15 years of experience. So as long as you get over that hurdle, that exists in Xing Yi, uh, you'll, you'll be okay. And the hurdle I'm talking about is when you see people practice Xing Yi, no matter how relaxed their body actually is, their movements look really forceful, really hard. So you see a lot of beginners in Xing Yi and a lot of people that practice incorrectly, they're doing tough guy martial arts. They're doing movie karate. That's not what real karate is. That's not what real Shingi is. That's not what real martial arts are. That's some movie shit. 
you know. You shouldn't go, when you practice Xing Yi, you should be relaxed. It's an internal style, so you want to increase that physical relaxation. If you can't feel your chi, if you can't feel chi when you're trying to do a martial meditation standing in sand t-shirt, you're not going to be able to feel any chi when you're doing just repetitive bung chuans across the floor, repetitive pi chuans across the floor. If you can't feel any of that, how are you going to be able to stay cool and calm in a fight? You know, if you learn a martial art, but try to apply it the way you tried to fight when you didn't know anything about fighting or martial arts, what's the point of studying a martial art? Then it just comes down to inborn ability and size. In which case, a big mean motherfucker who's naturally aggressive is always going to win. And the little guy, the old guy, the sick guy, the woman, the child is never going to stand a chance. So to make a martial art worthwhile, you need to be calm enough to actually learn not just the concepts in the, the martial art, whatever, you know, whichever one you choose, but to learn the techniques, to learn the tactics and the strategy of applying it. You know, I've seen people, again, I've, I've practiced Xing Yi with people who have tried to stay in the long range. What are you going to do with Xing Yi in the long range. You're going to do nothing because it's a mid to short range style. Mm. You need to be in close to use Xing Yi. Conversely, if you're studying long fist, what are you going to do if you're standing close enough to knee me in the balls or we're close enough that I could knee you in the balls? You're not going to be able to use long fist in the close range. You need to be at long range to mid range. You know, they all have their, they have their specialties. They have their uses. Um, they have their weaknesses too. Xing Yi has a big weakness. Like, like I said, if you're trying to stay in the long range and you practice Xing Yi, you're going to get dusted by somebody that uses a long range style because you're standing in the place they want to be to kick you in the head. Whereas what are you going to do? You're going to throw a bung chuan that's going to hit nothing because they're another foot and a half away from the end of your bung chuan. You need to get in close. You need to use that footwork to get in close to land your bum. But you need to have that nice, calm, deep breathing to stay mentally collective enough to realize I need to get past that kick that's aimed at my head so that I can get in close and punch him in the solar plexus. You need to be cool enough, calm enough to apply it. And another aspect of the Nagon is there are going to be times where while you're trying to get in the proper position, the proper relative position to apply your techniques, you're going to take a couple of hits. There are going to be times where, you know, you, we're all Xing Yi men. Well, what if, you're, what if you're playing around or sparring with somebody who's more of a wrestler, like a Greco-Roman wrestler or a jiu-jitsu guy or a judo guy or a Chinese shuai jiao guy? What are you going to do with somebody who has wrestling techniques? They're going to come into the close range and make physical contact with you. You need to be able to withstand what they're going to do in order to apply the techniques that you want to use, that you prefer. If you're like most people who practice Xing Yi, you're going to want to punch somebody in the chest or the face. So if their idea is to come and grab you by the arm, you need to be able to deal with that so that you can use that other arm to hit them. If somebody is a Taekwondo person and they like to kick, you need to be prepared to deal with getting kicked in the stomach or the face or the legs so that you can get in close and use that bung chuan to hit them in the chest. Uh, one of the big things about Nagong that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, they have that Naruto idea. There's a point early in the Naruto comics where they're having their uh, tournament arc, you know, the Chunin exams, and they show uh, the Huga clan, the people that have the x-ray eyes, and they use the point striking, and I'm going to turn off your, you know, your chakra. All right. A couple of the, like, senior ninjas make it a point to tell the kid characters, there's no way to train your internal organs to be stronger and withstand damage. That's false. 
the point of Nagong is to train the inside of your body. You know, you, you build up what makes an internal martial art internal isn't focusing on breathing or chi. It's that the thing that you're most concerned with training are the internal muscles, not the, you know, not the big muscles on the outside, like the quadriceps or the pectorals, the little muscles underneath those that are holding your body together, the muscles that attach your organs to your, you know, to your uh, skeleton inside the thorax, the muscles that attach the big muscles and the tendons and ligaments to the bones so that you can move. You want to build those. Up. I'm sure we've all had the experience either personally or we've seen it happen to somebody else. When you're a little kid and you see two young people get into a fight and that one kid makes a fist the wrong way and they throw that punch and they break their own hand or wrist. We've all seen that, or at least heard of it. All right, well, how do you train yourself to not get a broken hand or a broken wrist when you throw a punch? Mm. There are ways to do that. If there weren't, <laughs> humans <laughs> wouldn't have been solving problems for tens of thousands of years with face punching contests. With the, uh, with the organs, imagining that, um, I know that, you know, obviously the five fists are associated with those like fine, Mm -hmm. from organs and so i'm imagining that doing the form in and of itself would have an effect on the organ and but do you also have you also found that knowledge of anatomy and then like holding that intention has helped to has helped or could help to enhance that uh element of the practice yes the way that um suckers think about the organ and element associations that's garbage um, most people, you know, wood element is associated with bong chuan. Wood element is associated with the liver. Most people think practicing bung will help the liver. No. In and of itself, no. Just throwing straight punches is not going to do anything. But if you practice properly and you're using your waist to move your torso and using your torso to move your limbs, then yes, because it's a... Mm, you, know, you don't blink muscles. If you look at it from above, it's staying in place, but rotating on the waist, extending uh -huh. and contracting. Where's your liver inside your body? So, I mean, I'm, I'm saying it kind of as a rhetorical, but okay. you think about, you think about how the organs are laid out inside your body okay why does bung chuan help with the liver because what you're doing is moving the it's like a lateral extension of the body yeah. you're rotating the waist the area in your torso that the the liver is located in it's more to the side in the front of your torso that area is getting moved any stagnation energetically or in the other types because it's not just energy that circulates in your body blood circulates in your body lymph circulates in your body bile circulates in your body there's a lot of stuff moving around in there you i used to say this to people at the gardener when matt and i were both working there your body is a three-dimensional bag full of tubes with liquid in it that or you would say a hollow barrel <laughs> yeah i mean that's what it is you know except instead of being rigid like a barrel it's a barrel that can also yeah. bend like this it can mm. bend like this like this it can twist and turn the top and bottom can turn in different directions mm -hmm. relative orientation to each other you know one of the things that uh, that made me stand out when i was first learning Xing Yi is that while everybody else's bung chuan was two sticks extending from a stiff rigid torso my bung chuan was my chest and back closed and rounded when I loaded it up. And then when I released a right bung chuan, my chest and back would open, you know? Bung chuan, crossing fist. Hung is related to earth. The spleen is related to earth. How does practicing hung chuan, how does, how does that do anything for your, your spleen? 
Where's your spleen located in your body? In the front, a little bit off to the side, but basically in the front, underneath the solar plexus, right at the top, underneath the diaphragm. So if your torso is rigid, when you do hung chuan, and the only hung is the hands moving laterally, horizontally in front of you, your spleen doesn't get any benefit from that. But if you do hung chuan properly, the torso will curl a little bit along the spine. Pressure. The chest will close, the back will open, the upper body will come a little forward, the lower body will come a little bit forward from below. That's that trans like that transition motion as the rear hand starts to slide forward along the forearm. Then when the hands actually change and the rear hand becomes the lead hand, the lead hand pulls back to become the rear hand, the torso opens back up. So if you're simplistic in the way you think about it, there's no benefit because there's no magical connection between this stylized action and this abstract physiological function. You know, if you breathe, you have proper breathing, you get that physical and mental relaxation, you'll start to notice when you move, right, when I use my whole body, when I use my waist to move my body and my body to move my limbs, my bung chuan stops being just an extension of the arm and it starts to be the waist urges the body, the body urges the shoulder, the shoulder urges the elbow, the elbow urges the hand. Xing Yi has a document called Seven Followings. That's literally it. It's, 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 it's everything driven from the center, from the center to the periphery. You know, how does a wheel work to use a Tai Chi Chuan metaphor? The edge of the wheel is what most people focus on. But the utility and functionality is in the empty center where the spoke, uh, where the axle goes. It's a small movement in the center, but it's a big movement on the periphery, out on the edge. So proper body mechanics for martial arts are the same thing. The waist moves everything else. The waist moves the legs, the waist moves the arm. The waist moves the body around in three-dimensional space. So I always encourage people after a certain point, you gotta start practicing meditation. You gotta start incorporating that breathing into your practice or your martial arts gonna be useless. Somebody who follows instructions, like you guys, you took that suggestion. And Matt, you've definitely seen the benefits over the years. Alex, I can tell you're already starting to get the benefits. A certain tubby bastard went, oh, yeah, 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 and put up a front of agreement. But because I can read body language, and these aren't just really cool decorations, but I could actually see him, I knew that inside he was calling me names and be like, I'm not going to do that faggot stuff. I'm not going to actually breathe. No, no. Breathing's for losers. Yeah, yeah. That's why no matter how much you exercise, you're still fucking fat. <laughs> You know, how do you do push-ups every day for two years and still have, how do you still have titties after two years of doing push-ups every day? How do you still have no triceps after doing push-ups every day for two years? Girls go into the Marine Corps and do push-ups for three months and come out with fucking guns. I'm not yeah. talking about the rifles that they're issued. How's a, how's a dude going to do a hundred push-ups every day for two years and his arms are still these featureless tubes? <laughs> He must have had to have been doing them wrong um, to start with. How do you do push-ups wrong? I mean, the only way you can do them wrong is if you get down there and you don't actually move. You do the ones with the knees on the ground? You might have been doing girl push-ups. That's, just, oh, that's, that's, just that's, like, that's what I had to do. I had to do that. This time last year, I was doing girl push-ups, and I could barely do 10. <laughs> well, you were sick. Yeah, but I mean, you do what you got to do. Yeah. They have their utility. Hell yeah. Um. He's probably doing like, kind of like not even going down. You're just like, you know, the little, get a little spring, but not even yeah. go down. 
the ass up in the air. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, saying push up instead of fucking doing things. <laughs> push up, push up. Yeah, push up, push up. This isn't an episode of The Simpsons. You're supposed to be sweat. You should be sweating because you're exercising, not because you're overweight and you're eating in the middle of this. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Actually, um, I'm not sure if I if I showed you. Uh, did I show you? I um. I I decided to do 500 push-ups one night. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, I, I, I think I showed you. I showed um. I think I showed you the picture. I'll I'll um. Uh, it was uh. I was tallying off. I was trying to do them like every 20 or at least every 15. Cool. Uh, sets of 15, sets of 20. When and it, I took like like an hour and 30 minutes to do it all, and my body was aching so much. Like I wanted, I wanted to stop. I was like, Ugh. I could hear upstairs. You're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> was just like, His mom tried to stop. I'm talking. Uh, <laughs> let me suffer in peace. Right. Uh, and then at, at the end of it all, I couldn't get the last five out. I just couldn't. I was at I was at 495, and I couldn't. I just couldn't get that last five out. And I was like. Fine, I'll do one more 20. So I did, ended up doing uh, 515 push-ups over the course of an hour and 32 minutes or something like that. And it was, uh, I had to, uh, up here hurt. Not so much here hurt, but it, like down here hurt. Yeah. It hurt in all the right places. Um, I've had people that I've tried to teach uh, martial arts to panic after like a month. My lower back hurts. Good. Oh. Not that I'm quoting a conversation with anybody we've been making fun of for a half an hour, but oh, uh, I, I haven't practiced in a couple of weeks. My back was, was hurting. Where did it hurt? And he touches right above the kidneys and I go, okay. Put your arms up like this. Hold the ball in front of the chest. So he does it. And I walk right up with that look I got on my face when what I really want to do is punch you in the face, but I'm not allowed to do that yet. I put my arms on top of his wrists, and I start to push down a little bit. And of course, being a dork, he just didn't <laughs> let me do it. Put a little resistance in, I say. So he puts him up, I put my hands on, I push, he resists. Where in your body? Do you feel the strength for that resistance coming from? And he's like, from my, from my arms. And I was like, and that's why I can do this. And I like slapped his hands and they shot down and he hit himself in the balls and I laughed at his face. He had to do it like four times, but eventually he got those muscles in the middle of your spine, like the, the muscles along the middle of your torso. That's what holds the arms up. Mm. You know, I'm really glad, Alex, that when you just said like, you touch there as a place that felt good. Good. That means you aren't a fucking dork and you know what you're doing. You know? That's like you, that's where the, and again, what, what is that? That's the backside of your waist. The yeah. waist is what's powering the strength of a punch. Mm. It's not having big biceps, you know, it's not having, you know, wrists so huge that you can't wear a wristwatch. It's your, your back is what supports those arms. If you don't have any back muscles, you don't have a punch. If you don't have any, any back muscles, you don't have a kick, no matter how much flexibility you have. Great, great. You can hold your leg up high like Bruce Lee. Again, not that I'm making fun of a particular individual. You can hold your leg up there like Bruce Lee did in Enter the Dragon. Great. I let you kick me in my belly wound when I had a poo bag and I went, because it didn't do anything. <laughs> yes, I got struck multiple times in my ostomy during the first year that I had it. And every time I just looked down at the person and came forward and punched them in the solar plexus. So, again, I haven't yet 
I have yet to punch somebody in the solar plexus. I actually really want to do that. You've never, uh, even as a kid, you never like, have you ever seen? I mean, I, as a kid, it was, um, I wasn't as, obviously I was, I was a clear and blatant loser in York as a child. <laughs> I mean, uh, we probably all were, but like, I was just, oh. <laughs> I was a weirdo, but I was also quiet. And because I was big, nobody challenged me, shall we say? Yeah. It wasn't until junior high when people started hitting puberty that, that the shit talk started. But that yeah. ended pretty quick because, you know. Yeah. But when I was out. You know, yay tall, um, the tussles that I got into were mostly either ended in both of us bleeding from the face like you know, like go to try to hit each other and we both miss we you know clonk in a pole somewhere um or the my there there was one where I was I got bear hugged uh and I was like let me go he goes no all right last chance let me go no so I grabbed both of his hands and I did the one thing like one of the several things that I actually knew how to do really well on I guy which was step out of the box yeah tie the knot and just press forward and at the point at one point he was like he was like this he was like Arr! and i was behind him holding his hands like this he was begging me for mercy and this is a kid that was picking on me for like two years and i was like let me go let me go okay you don't have to let go okay. and then i so badly just wanted to just break this kid's fingers yeah. But, you know, being the goody little two shoes that I was, I couldn't find it in me to just just let the crack just happen. Yeah, so yeah. like that was like that was the extent of like any kind of fight that I actually got into. Um <laughs> I just took all of the food that I was just handed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I haven't eaten on camera before during these. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, going into like high school, I wasn't. I mean, getting into too many fights. Sure, like I shoved backers, but not like a full blown, like fist to the torso or anything like that or like a, grabbing someone by a throat and just hold them up like this or anything like that and there were a couple people that actually I probably could have done that with because they came up to hear on me yeah. they were like they they weren't like you know you see for every now and again you'll see someone like that's like this tall on you they're like five foot something yeah. or like going lower like into the four feet they're like they're built but they're not very tall they're not, you know, but none of them were this way. And a lot of them at the waist were going, you know, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So picking them up going like this probably would have been a little bit difficult for me. But just going like this would have strained their neck so bad it probably going to pop their head off. But Yeah. I used to do that. Um, since I'm the oldest in my generation um, and the next, like, on one side, there's me, then there's nobody for seven years. My younger brother and some of my older cousins. So when I was like 12, there were a bunch of four and five year olds running around. So I would just grab them by the head and pick them up. And by the time I got into high school, you know, like, yes, we're the same age, but I'm a foot taller than you and 75 pounds heavier. Grab that head, pick them up. <laughs> This is fun. This is fun. <laughs> I used to make people stuff themselves into lockers. I picked a kid up by the, you know, I grabbed this kid by the collarbones one time and got him up on his tiptoes and was like, I'm going to kill you right now. I started walking him towards Tremont Street because my high school was in downtown Boston. You know, no, no, no. I fought the baseball team at my school one time, all of them, and I won. Because it was a bunch of normal-sized teenagers, and I was six foot three and two hundred pounds, 
So Marvel Comics. One guy with muscles standing in the middle of a bunch of children like this. <laughs> Throwing people around. High school was fun. The man called Tubbs uh, has complained a bunch of times. So I'm like, you know, he loves talking about those days. Those were his glory days. So there were there have been a couple of times where he's made comments in front of people. Um, our high school was like a prison run by monsters, and I'm like, what are you talking about? That's not what it was like at all. And he'd be like, you were one of the monsters. And I'm like, what are you? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> You I had a man's him. body when the rest of you were boys. Sorry. Did you, did you like Liam back in the day? Yeah. I hit puberty at nine years old. I looked like, you know, my hairline came down to like here. Now I've got 40 year old hairline, but like, I basically haven't changed that much in the last 25 years. Uh, I could grow a full beard at like 12 years old. So when I was a, uh, my like second day of high school, a kid in my homeroom thought that I was a senior. And for that whole year, that kid refused to believe that I was a senior because I was six foot three and had like five o'clock shadow. But, you know, once you get older, it all evens out. Then it becomes who's prepared and trained fighting, who's learned how to defend themselves, whatever it may be, whatever type of martial art or martial practice, who's learned. So, you know. What do you think's good? Um, you were going to say? It's, it, it, so it's like, obviously there's been a popularity of MMA for the last like 10 years or, you know, 14 years 15 whatever um so i feel like there's probably more people walking around with some kind of like um you know jujitsu skills than other things and uh, and obviously there's to some extent that's not as pragmatic if you're like in the street but what's like for Xing, like just like thinking into the future for like Xing Yi training what, what do you think is like a good way to approach practice to be more prepared to, to deal with like wrestling type moves when that's like not like nothing i practice or encounter very often Okay, so um, again, Santi share is where you want to start for that. You want to really build up those leg muscles. Cool. You want to build up uh, your body awareness. So most people with a, like a jujitsu background or an MMA background, they're going to go for a single or double leg takedown. Mm. You know, ground and pound works great as long as you can ground somebody for the pounding. But if you can't get me off balance in order to dump me on the ground and then sit on me and then start the punching, then that, that's not going to work. So they're, and they're open when, they are trying, when they're going for it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's easy to talk about like this because we're yeah. all sitting on ass having a theoretical discussion. But the, the best way to prepare yourself is try to get, you know, try to make some friends in the jiu-jitsu community or in the MMA world and practice you know you you've got to figure out a way because again alex can get more benefit out of how i would deal with someone trying to take me down because we're the same height but i'm a i'm heavier than alex so some of the stuff that i do isn't just my height it's also how heavy i am so i can i can I can kind of sandbag and attempt to take it down a little bit more than a thinner guy who's over six feet could. And what I would do isn't going to help you, Matt, because you're shorter than I am. So mm -hmm. yeah. the easiest way to build up a lot of practical experience is you want to have, you want to do uncooperative and competitive practice of this sort. So you have somebody try and grab your leg and dump you down. Somebody try to grab your waist and dump you down, try to get you, double leg takedown, get both of those thighs and dump you down from the front, from the back, from the side. You know, you want to, you want to practice like that. Practice from a, a prepared position, a Santee share like position, practice from an unprepared standing straight up position. Those are the, those are the best ways to, to be like, to, to prepare for what you're going to face. Because mm. if you can't, 
a lot of martial artists, traditional martial artists, people doing stuff like what we do, they're getting their ass kicked by these MMA guys. Does that mean MMA is better than traditional martial arts? No, it means people who practice MMA practice to fucking fight other people. Yeah. And people doing traditional martial arts, getting their ass kicked, are, again, like we were talking about last week, the Taiji Chuan master who claimed that he could blow up the universe with his fucking mental powers, getting his ass kicked by the MMA guy in China last year. The MMA guy was prepared to punch other people in the face and be punched in the face. The Taiji master was wearing silk pajamas and doing fucking dances shaped like martial arts. So he got his ass handed to him. Yeah. The fact that you like, again, if you can't even ask the question that Matt asked, you're going to get, it doesn't matter if you're fighting somebody who's good at jujitsu or bad at jujitsu. You're fighting somebody who is prepared for a realistic encounter on their terms. They know how to apply the tactics that they've learned. They're going to win and you're going to lose. But if you learn how to apply your tactics better than them, you're going to win. You know, the Chinese recognize four general categories of techniques, punching, kicking, wrestling, joint locks. There's an interrelationship among them. In general, kicking is going to defeat um, punching because legs are longer than arms. But if I'm a better puncher than you are a kicker, I'm going to get inside your kick and I'm going to punch you in the face. You know? Joint locks or wrestling can be used to really effectively beat a puncher. We've all seen MMA fights. We've seen, you remember early MMA from back in the 90s and the early 2000s. Guys that could only, only kickbox or only punch getting handled by Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys. That's why everybody who does MMA has at least a little bit of Brazilian jiu-jitsu now because if you can only punch... All I have to do is get you off your feet, and you can't punch now. So, Xing Yi is a, is a primarily striking with the fists type of martial art. If you want to be able to strike with your fists, you need to be able to prevent the jujitsu guy or the wrestler from getting you on your back. That's where you're going to get wasted. So, excellent question, Matt. It's, again, it'll be in the it'll be the thighs. Like, look, how do, how did the jujitsu? against each other figure that out and adapt that into your practice you know you don't need to learn you don't need to dedicate yourself to jujitsu to being able to to be able to defend yourself against jujitsu you just need to understand their tactics and then you can devise a defense to like you, you know you you come up with a workaround or you come up with a defense so that you are in a position to apply your preferred tactics. So in, in, in a case of differing techniques, you're a puncher, they're a wrestler. You need to come up with defenses against wrestling so that you can punch. But if it's a puncher against a puncher, you need to develop, you need to devise a way to train your body to be punched. Like, how do I learn how to take a punch to the stomach so that I don't get the wind knocked out of me? How do I learn how to take a punch to the face so that I don't get knocked out or get my nose broken? You know? for, for when you look at uh, Western boxers, the guys with the glass jaws, they're not always weaklings. Sometimes they're people who just, their neck is a little bit weaker. Hmm. Know, the other guy can punch harder than their neck can brace against. They get rattled, literally rattled. Their brain rattles around inside their head. It's a knockout. So when you punch, one of the things you want to do is practice that proper posture for defense. How do you defend yourself? Part of being able to defend yourself as a boxer is having the strength to take a punch. So if you're dealing with somebody like in China, Xing Yichuan is rare because not many Chinese martial arts will directly, overtly, deliberately punch an opponent in the face. It's a little disrespectful. 
to some of them. Do you think practicing with headgear could help with that? No. Maybe. I don't recommend it. But I mean, again, I've got a hard ass head. And when I'm healthy, I've got a, a like a moderately thick neck. I'm completely prepared to be punched in the face. You know, I got hit, like I said before we were recording my my baseball bat story. I got hit in the head with a baseball bat, and I didn't die from it. So, sure. what's what's some soy boy's fist gonna do to me? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. What I mean. But like headgear, the real reason that I don't like safety equipment in sparring, why I I prefer bare knuckle full contact sparring is if you get jumped in the street or you get into a fight in the street you're not going to have headgear on you're not going to have a mouth guard you're not going to have right gloves of any sort you're not going to have wraps you're going to have you're going to have these exactly as yeah. they are so i thought it was just like as a kind of lead in you know what i mean like in terms of like you know maybe like you know first couple of times practicing full contact or something like that until you feel more comfortable in that it's more it's more like depends on the person yeah. You know, for somebody who's really skittish or a woman, I'd probably you know, I'd be more inclined. But for you, put them up. Sure. Because I know, <laughs> you know if, panic, <laughs> if it's somebody who's, who's more likely to panic, somebody who's more likely, you know, you can, there are people that are like that. They know, all right, we're going to do uncooperative practice. I'm not going to hurt you, but I am going to take a real swing at you. They're still going to panic. Mm. So a person like that, yeah, you know, if, if, if they can only spar with the protective gear, well, not only can you not fight, you can't really spar either. Mm. But for somebody who's more realistic, who's more serious, somebody like you, right. You know, if we're out fucking walking down the street, Hey, let's go into that park and have a quick spark. I won't hit you in the balls. Don't gouge my eyes out. All right. We can, we can work under those agreements. Oh yeah. So, you know, I, I prefer that because it's more realistic. Again, being, being a Shin Yi man at heart, I prefer as realistic as possible because you're not going to, I don't go to tournaments. So I don't have sport fights. Every fight I've ever had has been, somebody tried to take something from me against my will or somebody tried to hurt me and I had to protect myself, protect my wallet, protect my, what, you know? So that's, that's my, my mindset when it comes to that sort of stuff. I prefer to have a full contact type of spar, a bare knuckle type of spar because, you know, I never put on gloves as a kid. Yeah. It was just, you know, kids and dot punching each other in the mouth. I remember Bruce Lee and the, uh, those, uh, you know, those like bright colored training books he had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I always like that. I've never practiced this, but I like that there was an exercise where you lay on, like one person lays on the ground and the other person drops a medicine ball in their abdomen and then progressively would be like a larger medicine ball or more force. Hmm. That just sounded awesome. Yeah. yeah I mean, that, that's any martial art you're going to have to condition yourself to take blows. You're not just, nobody is, is so good or so talented that they're only going to throw punches and never take punches. So that ties right back into what we were just talking about. Why do I want to pe people to practice bare knuckle? Because you're going to get hit in the face with bare knuckles. You're going to get, you, you know, you're going to get kicked in the stomach with a foot. So we might as well just, practice like that you're going to get slapped in the face with an open hand no one no one's going to come up with a glove on and throw a fake chop at you they're going to do like this and they're going to really try and hit you in the throat so you know <laughs> learn how to defend it but also just go like this and i'll lightly fucking chop you in the you know and yes alex you haven't gotten there yet but i'll get there soon enough yeah. i'll just Dr. Uh, Young's hit me in the throat before. Hmm? While I was your, in YMA, I, I, I caught multiple. Like one time he was talking about using the tiger's mouth. Mm -hmm. Somebody the throat yoke to defend yourself. Yeah. And he was making the motion, looking at the rest of the class. He didn't realize I took two steps forward. 
So he thought that I was out of reach and he was just going like this, but I was actually standing like right here. And he went like this, bam, right in the throat. And it's like, everybody gasped. And he was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I kind of like tried to use my body language to imply like, uh-uh, I'm not them. <laughs> you know, if I wasn't fine, I'd be laying on the ground at your feet. I didn't say that. I should have been like, yeah, stop, dude. Man. <laughs> so in the typical Bostonian fashion. Yeah, because years before I had ever started at YMA, I had been hit in the throat before. So, you know, when I got hit in the throat when I was like 11, yeah, it went down the way he expected. But by the time I was 24, he yoked me and I went, that's it? Like, you didn't put any force into it. Why would I fall over? Hmm. You know, you didn't get me on the windpipe. Why would my voice be changed, you know? But with a lot of people, they're so weak you touch them even slowly in there. <laughs> Fuck that. No, you know, you don't want to be like that. I don't want people to be like that. You know, I'm a bit of an asshole. Like I can be difficult to get along with, but whether I like you or not, I don't want to see anybody so weak. That, you know, you fart at them and they're crippled. I don't want to see that. As hilarious as that is, that's a great image, but I don't want that to be anybody's real life. I don't want anybody to, you know, having been sick and weak and feeble and been ridden, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. You know, I want my worst enemy strong so that we can have a fight so that I can fucking win because I'm better. Yeah, I am going to crack another Guinness once I finish that one, even though I probably shouldn't, but... <laughs> but yeah, no, that's that's the, you know, you... That's the, that's the point, you know, for, for people that are, how does a, a weak and feeble person, how does an undersized malnourished person, you know, how does an, how does a malnourished boy grow up to be a man capable of defending himself against somebody who is so much bigger and stronger and well-nourished? You have to be able to train that inside just as much as the outside. You don't just learn attacking techniques or defending techniques. You have to have the ability to be in a fight. You have to be able to withstand a punch. You have to be able to, to deal a punch. So, and all of that comes from the nagong. The nagong comes from sensitivity, built up from breathing, built up from the chi. You know, we've, we've really ranged far afield, but it all comes back to the same thing, the topic that we started with. You breathe in order to feel the chi. If you want to be a dickhead about it, you can take a very Western, very materialist viewpoint and be like, she's not real. Da, 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 da. You know, if you've spent any time talking with other martial artists in real life or the internet, definitely going to have run across those kinds of people. Well, she isn't real. It doesn't matter if it's not real. If there is no such literal thing as chi, the metaphor and concept of chi is still great because it gives you a means to actually train in a systematic fashion so that you can gain the ability to take a punch to the throat, to the solar plexus, to the face, you know? Not everybody is gonna be like me. I was born big and I love to drink milk so I have hard bones. Well, what's a guy who doesn't like, like is lactose intolerant and is only five foot two gonna do, you know? In order for martial arts to have value, they have to give somebody smaller and weaker than me the same amount of benefit that they give somebody big and naturally, you know, resilient. They have to be able to give the same benefit. Martial arts are worthless if only somebody like me can use them. A woman has to be able to use them too. A kid has to be able to use them too. A small man has to be able to use them too to defend themselves against somebody like me. So, and that's the whole point of it, as I keep saying. So the whole, the whole benefit of chi, whether it's real or not, and yes, by the way, it is real. It is real. <laughs> is is it's it's, it's there? It's it's the way that you train. It's, it's a qual- like I said, qualitative idea as opposed to uh, like a materialist idea. A lot, of the big, <laughs> a lot of the big benefits in martial arts are those 
things that you can't see on the outside. Yeah. That that kinesthetic awareness of your own body, that tactile sensitivity where you make contact with another body and you can see what's going on. That advancement of the ability to read body language where you look at somebody that you're not touching and you can still tell that they need to try and punch you in the mouth. You know? And then when you get to those higher levels, you start getting um, a higher order version of those effects are that kinesthetic awareness that I've mentioned being sublimated into your unconscious or your subconscious mind. So Dr. Young uses the driving metaphor. When you first learn how to drive, you're using your conscious mind and you're trying to keep track of all these different things. Ooh. But then when you get some skill at it, you drive, but you do it semi-automatically. So you can also have a conversation with someone else in the car. You can, you know, listen to the radio. You can have a hands-free phone call because you don't want to be unsafe. But like, you, you can do the same thing with martial arts. You can make your attacking and defending uh, strategies and techniques. You can sublimate those things. That's how you get those supernatural magical effects i wasn't looking at you you tried to punch me in the face i still moved out of the way that's not magic that's not psychic powers that's i've practiced so much i now have an unconscious reflex of defense so and there's a way there you don't need to be super athletically talented and gifted to get that you can be a dork. It's just going to take you a little bit longer and you have to work a little bit harder than a talented person. But anybody can get there. You just need, you need the method. Like Dr. Yang says, you, you need the roadmap. The training method is the roadmap. It's going to show you how to get to your destination faster than if you're just blindly wandering around. The benefit of having an experienced, competent teacher is, you know, what took me 10 years to get to, I can get you there in five because you're not going to waste as much time as I did. I know what works and what won't. So I'll just give you what works. You don't need to waste time on, you know, two years going down a path that leads to a dead end that either hurts yourself or doesn't do anything. You know, of course, from a teacher's perspective, if the student is a dickhead who doesn't listen, then doesn't matter how much you offer, a dickhead is going to be a dickhead. Somebody who's willful, somebody who's tubby, shall we say, is going to ignore the good advice and the proper methodology, and their head is going to waggle from side to side ever so slowly, and they're going to do what they want. Are you still Get down on the ground and stick their ass up in the air, or they're going to fish flop their, their hips and their belly onto the ground, and they're going to say, push push up every day for two years <laughs> weird flabby sausages for arms and man titties not that i'm bitter so instead of just having a theoretical discussion because we've been on for about an hour and a half um for this one i'm gonna actually talk a little bit i'm going to wrap up by talking about the the chi sensing exercise okay so you want to be in a comfortable position so if i hold my hands in a comfortable position you're not going to be able to see what i'm doing because they'll rest off camera so i'm going to hold my hands up a little bit. you can also do it like this if this is the most that's fine but you basically want to bring however you need you know maybe you're one of those people who needs to bring them this close maybe you're one of those people who just naturally has it, you know, whichever way you do it. You want to have your hands in a comfortable position so that your body is nice and relaxed. Slow down that breathing, calm that breathing down. Another plug, pick up a copy of A Brief Introduction to Meditation. And in the first part, where I talk about the basics of breathing, slow, calm, quiet, that kind of stuff. In through the nose out through the nose, that's, that's ideal. Really relax that body, 
and don't try to force the chi to flow. Mm -hmm. Try to quiet your mind down, calm yourself down so that you can just feel it in and of itself. Generally, for most people, talented or not, the first thing they're going to feel is they're going to feel the chi. They're not going to feel the flow of the chi. You know what I mean? So you keep those hands nice and close. Get that breathing nice and calm, nice and steady, nice and deep. You start to feel that warm feeling in the hands, that tingling feeling in the hands. If you've ever, as a kid, you ever took two magnets and pointed both North Poles at each other or both South Poles at each other, you feel that repulsion feeling. It's sort of like that. You want to be able to feel the chi interacting, the chi from one hand interacting with the chi from the other hand. Focusing on the breathing is the most important aspect of this exercise. Because if you try and use that discursive mind too much and think, you're gonna lose the feeling because you're gonna get wrapped up in the thinking. So keep focused on the breathing. It'll build up your relaxation and your sensitivity at the same time. And if you're one of those people who's unfortunate enough to be like blind and deaf to chi, one of those people that's just kind of insensate and doesn't feel it. Worst case scenario is you will get improved breathing and physical relaxation. So. The more you do this, the better you get. You know, watching this video, take a look at Alex. Look at where his hands are in, in relation to his body. When I first showed him this a couple of years ago, he started with his hands like this. And now here he is almost at shoulder width. So consistent practice will help you improve that sort of thing. And this is something that you can do by yourself every day. You can do this with other people in lots of different ways. Um, I don't know if you ever saw me do this, Matt, when we were both at the museum, but I used to uh, do this thing where I'd mention chi, and if people didn't believe, I would have them hold their hand out and I would put my hand over their hand or arm and I would emit some chi and move my hand around and they would feel the feeling that you're working on in this, you know, with your hands like this, someone's hand, someone's arm, and they'd be like, oh my God, what is that? That's chi. You can feel my chi because I've been doing this so much. <laughs> Relax versus limp. That's the difference. Yeah. It's an easy way to make a demonstration you know i mean i'm not gonna lie when i was in college too i also used that on girls i was dating so say baby you want to learn about the power of kung fu <laughs> so it, it's just it's something you know it's an easy way to build up that sensitivity and that awareness and it's also an easy way to gain experience with practical application you know, beyond the, the simple parlor trick of, ooh, I, I can, my hands, and ooh, I'm not touching you, but you feel something. Like, beyond the parlor trick of, of that, what's a benefit you can do? Well, you fill your hand up with chi, and you give somebody a massage, you're going to feel a hell of a lot more than just if you just grab somebody and start rubbing. Yeah. They're going to feel a hell of a lot more than someone just rubbing their back. And again, if you apply it to dating, there are going to be other benefits. That's the basis for the dual cultivation sexual qigong stuff. You know, there, there's a lot of anything you can think to put this into. You can use this to expand and refine and improve. So we were specifically talking about qi and martial arts. When you combine martial arts with chi, you get ne gong. Ne, internal gong, kung fu, kung fu, internal kung fu. That's how you get that. 
build up the mind, build up the sensitivity, build up the body. So you don't want to just, you know, yeah, you should lift weights. You should exercise. You should build your body up. But there's going to come a time where you're not 25 anymore. There's going to come a time when you're 41 like me or when you're older. You're still going to need health when you're older. You're still going to need to defend yourself. So this is a qualitative improvement. So when you lose the advantages of youth, you still have something to fall back on. So after all that, any thoughts, any questions, any observations? And did you, um, going back to the, uh, the stuff about the anatomy and various parts of the organs and you building up the, uh, building up the internal organs, mm -hmm. do you have a copy of, um, or do you ever look over a copy of, uh, Grey's Anatomy just to like pick out? Yeah, that was the first anatomy book that I studied. But if you, if you look, you know, like if you go to Amazon, just search, you know, anatomy and, you know, martial arts anatomy or anatomy martial arts or anatomy for martial arts, you know, you'll find a bunch of different books because this is a subject that obviously this is, this is important, not just for you to take care of yourself, but also if you want to be able to use martial arts, you have to know where to strike, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you refuse to believe in chi after our very clear internet demonstration of uh, she, you know, you still need to know where the solar plexus is so that you can punch somebody in it. It's easy to poke somebody in the eyes or hit a dude in the balls because we all know where those are relatively positioned, but, you know, not everybody grew up getting punched in the solar plexus by their mom's brothers. So not everybody knows where the solar plexus is. Well, if you didn't have an uncle punching you in the solar plexus the way I was so lucky to have, where how are you gonna fucking learn that? You need an anatomy book. So yeah. There's uh there's one that I got that's um it's not exactly as detailed as something like Gray's Anatomy or a medical anatomy book, but it's a decent uh martial arts book. When we're done recording, I'll I'll um I'll find the name and uh, send it to you guys so you so can be prepared. But you know, if you find something that catches your eye that you like or that you prefer, you can pick it up. I would recommend something like that. That'll help. Because some of them will also have the, uh, you know, the, the chi channels and the, the chi the chi circulatory system will be something that they discuss in addition to where a nerve cluster is. This is where your liver is relative. This is where your balls are, you know. That, that sort of thing can help as well because, you know, if only for the practice of more advanced types of circulation meditation, more advanced uh, Nagong stuff, you know, if you pick up uh, the Marshall Qigong uh, DVD from Dr. Yang's um, DVD set on, on uh, Qigong and Qi development, or you pick up the specific two disc uh, set on Nagong practice specifically, you'll see in there he talks about stuff like, you know, breathing with the Lao Gong, you know, bringing the chi to the Lao Gong point in the hands, bringing it to the Yang Chuan in the feet. You know, there are, there are all sorts of different martial exercises and those are just the examples that he gives in, in his work is, is a really, like it's general in the sense that it is not style specific. So somebody who practices karate, that's a Japanese martial art, they can still gain martial benefits from learning those exercises. But because all three of us are Xing Yi guys, if we were talking about Xing Yi specific Nagong, I would talk about stuff like three hearts face the center or four tips or thread breathing or something like that. You know, those are Xing Yi specific exercises. There's a Red general breathing. type of thread breathing, qi circulation meditation, but then there's also the xing yi thread breathing, which the only real difference is it's more martial. So, did you ever experiment with the um, shuan Zhuo? Is that the, the Chinese uh, Chinese wrestling? 
How do you say uh, it? Yeah, I've learned a little Shui Zhao. Shui Zhao, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Yang has a, there, there's a Taiji Shui Zhao, uh, like a, the wrestling techniques from Taiji Chuan uh, DVD. Because Taiji Chuan is a, one way to describe Taiji Chuan is civilian self-defense. So you, lo- you use a lot of like, I don't want you to hurt me, but I don't want to hurt you type techniques. Joint locks. I'll take control. Please don't hurt me. I don't want to hurt you. Wrestling. They try to punch you. You get in close and dump them. Stuff that works when you're already in contact with somebody because the big concern in Taiji Chuan is you want to get into close range. Touching. That way, if you suck, like I was saying earlier, if you suck at sensitivity, you're still going to be able to tell when someone's trying to get an arm free to punch you in the face because you're already touching each other. You know? Um, but yeah, looking over Shui Zhao, that'll give you some ideas. You can use Shui Zhao defenses against an MMA guy or a Jiu Jitsu guy because a takedown is a takedown. You know, there's only so many ways to grab another person by their waist or their legs and dump them on the ground. You know, human body is the same, even if the strategy and the tactics are different. So if you learn mechanically effective defenses against a punch, it's going to work no matter what style of boxing a person practices. YMAA also has a book, a DVD on just Shui Zhao in general and a book on Shui Zhao in general. I recommend both of them. I have a lot of YMAA books, having been a student there um, for several years. So, and for a long time, the best, in my opinion, the best martial arts books were all, and DVDs were all almost exclusively YMAA stuff because they mm-hmm. would go into depth and like in detail, talk about it. You know, Dr. Young learned traditionally uh, from a guy that lived in a hut that he built himself up in the mountains outside of his town that he grew up in. But he also, you know, went to school to study physics in college and all that. So he's he's got a scientific Western materialist type of perspective, but he also has a uh, traditional Chinese energetic perspective as well. When you put them both together, you get the maximum benefit. You just have to be willing to um, take both seriously, if you know what I mean. You know, you don't have to start walking around you know, it, it's not when uh, when I first started um, at YMAA and my parents you think, heard the story. I'm sure. Um, after about a year, my parents figured out that I was going to YMAA and that I was practicing martial arts, and my mother started to cry because she thought I converted to their weird foreign religion. And I looked at my dad. And I was like, Ma, I don't even practice our religion. You think I'm going to do what somebody else says? Like, that that's not what this is. So. You got a funny story, actually. Yeah. Real quick. Uh, I had a neighbor, a place I used to live before. um, In a uh, a town just outside of Boston. you know, I was going back and forth with this, this neighbor of mine. Uh, he he studied like karate and Krav Maga and something like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, he was living at home with his parents. Me being you know fifteen year old, just going just chatting about martial arts and techniques and stuff like that. Um, and uh, my mom was actually we were we were going back and forth. We were just talking about like formalities. Uh, for Aikido, which was, you know, you, before you get on the mat, you bow, and yeah. then you get on the mat. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he said something along the lines of, like, whoever you, um, whoever you, uh, you know, whoever you worship or whoever, whatever respect you do it. My mom's like, no, 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 we don't, we don't worship, you know, we don't, we don't worship this dude, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and yeah, you know, he was like, "Oh, okay." So, and then he said, uh, "We we continued the conversation." But then again, he said, "You know, whoever you worship, or blah blah blah." Um, 
Uh, and we're like, we, we, we don't worship the dead. It's weird. And it was really funny because um, eventually it got to the point. I was like, dude, we're, we're just, we're just Protestants. We're just normal Protestants. And my mom's like, no, we're Baptist. And I was like, oh. it, it was, it was weird and awkward and funny. Um, but at the time I'm just like, just a normal Protestant, just whatever no you're a baptist yeah i'm i'm in the land of baptists right now so i'm sure if i'm not careful i'm gonna find myself in a situation where somebody's gonna get wide out and be like we are baptists i don't fucking care <laughs> baptists Great. are you're funny but they're annoying that that's fucking good for you i what i i don't get in ah oh, jeez, i gotta this has become a religious conversation now. I don't understand the... What's the deal with that? Like, what makes them weird? I don't get it. Like, Everybody's what? weird. I know, but, but what, what, what makes... Like, there's weird. something about... Oh, go ahead. There's, in, in the general community of, of Christians, right? Yeah. You, got, you got Catholics, Orthodox Christians. Then you've got all of the Protestant, you know, sects. Yeah. You got Presbyterians and Episcopal, Episcopalians, Lutherans and whatnot. There's something about Baptists that makes them like annoying and weird. Yeah. Really annoying. It's like there's something that like, like other Christians like at Baptists and they kind of just go. There's something like that. It's, it's like, more it's more ecstatic, isn't it? Like where they're trying to get themselves all like psyched up. With they're the probably from the like the Protestant grouping. They're a lot closer to like a Pentecostal, you know, like all of the types of Christianity that emerged in North America after European colonization. Yeah. Baptists are probably the type of Christian from Europe that is closest to the type of Christian that emerged in North America. I see. You know? and, and like, without, I could, I could sit here and be a dickhead and make fun of them and make jokes like that, but if, if like we're being serious about it, Think about it. like what's the difference between Anglicans and Catholics? In one, whoever rules England is the head of the church. In the other, whoever's the Pope is the head of the church. But how are they really different beyond that? They're not very different beyond that. Think about they, well, they don't, they don't use Latin in the rites, right? I mean, like in yeah. Uh, Anglican. Yeah, so it's like there's for a lot of a lot of types of Christian, whether they're Protestant or not there's not a whole lot of differences, you know? The biggest difference between the Orthodox and the Catholic used to be one used Greek and one used Latin. You know, now that most Christians are using whatever their local language is, now that they're using vernacular, there's not a whole lot of difference between certain types of Christians. Well, so, I think in way, one, of the, one of the differences with Protestant versus Catholic or... Um, is the, the, the basis of Catholicism, Catholicism initially was like, you couldn't read. And so it's like, they're going to do the thing and you just kind of believe it and shut yeah. up and experience yeah. it. So I think that the rites might be more complex, yeah. uh, but like the mysteries are more complex. Whereas like Protestantism, as I understand it, it was like, now you can have a relationship with the book and we'll just be in this like yeah. boring room and it's fine. Yeah, yeah. you it's can sit in a room with a bunch of other dickheads that can barely read and make up your own ideas and wave a Bible around and say that you're right. Not that I'm just yeah. what most Protestants actually do. Right. Which is funny because maybe that was actually like a side of like an undesirable side effect of Protestantism is that yeah. um, maybe that like that kind of like, oh, this is the word of God verbatim. It's like, who told you yeah, that? Exactly. Why do you no, it's that? not. It's the, it's the word of some hopped up goofball looking to fuck your underage daughter. Not that I'm describing certain types of Christianity that exist in North America right now. But like, I, I, grew up catholic in boston where almost everybody is catholic but i grew up with a lot of people who weren't catholic and i've had a lot of conversations about religion i usually describe catholicism to non-catholics like this catholicism is a religion designed to teach you that you are not in charge and that you should be quiet because that's what it is it's you're not the boss you don't get a boss is the pope and the pope isn't the boss the current pope doesn't seem to understand that he's not the boss so fuck that guy but 
like Matt said, the point of a lot of types of Protestantism was for people to have a more direct relationship with their religion and their, their experience of God and all that. But what did you get instead? You got, a, you got a dickhead trying to have sex with your underage daughter, waving a Bible around yeah. to justify the fact that he's trying to have sex with your 14 year old daughter. Fuck that. You know? Yeah. Again, a certain individual had a lot of experiences with Pentecostal and evangelical Christians. They love calling Catholics and Anglicans and Lutherans and Mormons and Jews and Muslims, oh, you people are devil worshipers. You know, oh, people that go to get tarot card readings, that's the devil, that's magic. And then what do they do? They turn around and I bind the Holy Spirit. What the fuck? Come on. It's like watching an episode of Naruto. They're waving their hands around and being magic. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. You know? If Jesus Fire told me, bolt. yeah, if Jesus told me I'm not allowed to make up my own interpretation and do magical spells to influence God and change reality, guess what he told you too, motherfucker? Again, this doesn't need to be religious, but it does tie back into what we we're talking about with Chi because there's a similar aspect. You know, everybody's got a different experience of God and different preferences for their religious uh, rituals. You know, if you don't have an actual experience, then you can just do whatever you want and call that an experience. This exercise that holding the chi ball is so valuable because you will actually feel chi. Yes, you should be able, if you practice uh, a martial art for 20 years, you should be able to feel your own chi. But a lot of people are suckers. A lot of people have much, much, much worse health than anybody in the past ever did. They're much less physically developed yeah but we're in the past so they need something extra and that is something extra that will give you an objective experience of chi so that you aren't running around spouting off you know your interpretation of some shit that you saw in a shaw brothers movie you have something real concrete here i did this and i learned i'll show you how to do this you can have a concrete experience and now we have a basis for comparison and discussion if there was some sort of something like that for a spiritual experience, we probably wouldn't have a lot of the problems we have within Christianity and between religions in the world. But again, we don't. So in the meantime, let's just make fun of religion. <laughs> so, yeah. Chi, Nagong, it's real. You can actually train it. You just have to understand it's not magic powers. It's not like you know tirating with making fun of religion not like one of these weirdo religions where they say if you say these prayers to our weird god you're gonna get magic powers over the universe no you're not you're just gonna be some asshole saying weird stuff that's gonna make regular people uncomfortable training internal martial arts training your chi isn't gonna give you magic powers you're not gonna become goku you're not going to be flying around and shooting Kamehameha's. You're not going to become Naruto and be doing clone techniques. No, you need, what you will do is become calmer, gain some health, improve your physique, sharpen your mind, clear your mind up. That's the whole point. Meditation isn't something that you talk about to make people feel bad on the internet. No, meditation is something you do to improve the quality of your life. Are you exhausted at the end of your work day? Ready to fall unconscious as soon as you sit down when you get home? Well, meditation is a way for you to at least recharge your mental energy. You know, mm. you might be physically tired. I work in a machine shop as assembling um, trailers, and I'm not exhausted when I come home because I practice this stuff. I've been there for a couple of months, so my body is, is back in decent shape. So I have the physical endurance and stamina to withstand picking up metal and moving it around. But I've been practicing meditation for decades. So after a 10-hour workday, I come home and I sit down and I might say like, oh, my hands are a little sore or my back's a little stiff or my feet are tired. 
but I can still have a conversation with my girl. I can still read a book. I can still, you know, I don't have to sit down and veg out and be semi-unconscious in front of the TV. I can still be useful. So at the least, that's a big benefit of meditation, uh, chi development, and Nagong, internal martial arts. You don't, you won't be completely ruined. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll wrap up. We're back. So to begin to wrap things up, everything is improved by adding chi to it. Add chi to your meditation, your meditation gets improved. Add chi to your exercise regimen, it becomes chi gong. The regimen gets improved, your health gets improved. Add it to martial arts, it becomes an internal martial art, and everything gets better. Your health gets better, your mind gets better, you get more power. And who doesn't love more power? So, gentlemen, thoughts, reactions, anything to add? I got a lot more to practice. No thoughts. <laughs> I took a lot of notes though. There's a lot of, uh, I, I, it seems like with each uh, discussion group, there's like increasing avenues of inquiry and, and experience, which is great. I'm not sure if anybody has noticed this yet, but <laughs> nice. I noticed that. Each episode, something comes up and that's the topic that I choose for the subject of the next episode. So. No, I am not going to choose some of the things that we just were talking about during the break as a subject for the next discussion group. So we won't be making fun of anybody's degenerate foot lust. Well, we will be doing that, but we won't be talking about degenerate foot lust as the subject of the video. So anyway, chi circulation, learn the basics. Use your breathing to develop your sensitivity so that you can gain the feeling of chi. Then use the holding the ball exercise in conjunction with the breathing to develop your sensitivity to chi. Then start adding it into partner exercises so that you can learn how to use chi effectively for yourself and for others in a healing context, if that's your avenue, appro av avenue of approach. There. Or use it to... Uh, refine your body and to augment your physical strength get the gin that internal martial artists talk about the refined force and gain power that way so this has been the kung fu discussion group episode five i'm your uncle sickness with me as always matt yoga midnight and alex mako decal everybody improve your kung fu visit us at sicknesskungfu.com have a nice night stupid no good with no talent you shouldn't talk like that we can fix your problem very quickly